Hey, indie filmmakers, I'm Griffin Hammond, and today I'm joined by a special guest, my very good filmmaking friend, Justin Johnson. Hello, Justin. Hello, thanks for I'm I'm a big fan of the podcast, and I'm glad to be on. Yeah, this is episode 77 oh my God. <laughs> of the Hey Indie Filmmakers podcast, and we've never had you on. Man, I mean, I've only listened to like 74 of them, <laughs> so I feel like I'm really behind. It's not really a guest-driven podcast, but... You're such an exciting guest, and oh, you're here. Thank you. In New York, I'm here. <laughs> exciting and present. Those are my two <laughs> biggest qualities. So there's a lot of things I want to talk about today because I think one, our audience will like the kind of work you do, the exciting projects that you've worked on. Uh, we might just start with what you're doing here. Tell us about the kind of project that you're on assignment on right now. Yeah. So I um, have been doing this series for a company called Abbott. And they're like a technology kind of medical company, and they make all these really cool medical devices. Yeah. And so I started the series last year. I've done stuff about like an implantable heart monitor for people with heart arrhythmias. I've done the first one I did was about people who basically their job is to monitor the world's blood supply yeah. and make sure that it's free of infectious disease. And for that shoot, I was like in a room with like a refrigerator that had. I think it's like 30,000 samples of HIV going back to oh, the wow. 90s. Because it's like a virus is like a computer program. Yeah. So they keep evolving. So they can basically keep like the beta versions of it <laughs> in this fridge. So they basically, if they can see where it came from, they can hope to see how it's going to continue evolving. Right. Because they need to always know how to keep the blood supply safe. So it's a series all about their innovations and their technology. And um, it's one of the things like, so for me, focusing on documentary, you kind of have to find the right fit for like how do you do documentary um but also like pay your rent <laughs> right yeah <laughs> and it's not you know documentaries aren't like it's not like the avengers or something like that very few of them make a lot of money so right. find your kind of niche in the corporate world and then go from yeah. there when you and i have a kind of a similar portfolio when it comes to the way that we do documentary like you have your one-off short films that you've taken to film festivals uh you have Feature too? Yeah, yeah, feature that went to film festivals, and then I had a short last year that played at a bunch of film festivals. Yeah. And then you're also doing client work. Yeah, bringing the same. That's like the set. trifecta. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and I, and so it's it's been really cool because um, being able to do a, a longer series with a client really lets you. I've done a lot of one-off commercials in the kind of documentary style. Yeah, and I always wanted to be like. You know, whether it was for uh, Ram trucks or microphone brands or for New Balance shoes, like about athletes or whoever, I'm like, let's just do like 10 of these. Because once you do the first one, you kind of get that flow and the format established. It's a shame just to do one and then move on. Yeah. So this has been a really cool opportunity with a really great client to just, I think we've run like six or seven now. Yeah. So I don't know, it's, I'm really enjoying it and, and I'm, I'm learning stuff and it's, it's really fun. I love your your itinerary on this trip like we had such a small window to meet up <laughs> here in a hotel yeah, outside yeah. of new york you landed today at two tomorrow at 10 a.m you start your shoot yeah and then you're on a plane again at 6 30 tomorrow yes yep that is correct <laughs> and i just came from florida and before that a week and a half ago i was in switzerland and then once i get back home i'm gonna have about six days until i'm in norway yeah so this it's it's like insane <laughs> but it's like absolutely the life that i just love living because one i get tons of airplane points right so i, I enjoy that yeah <laughs> <laughs> but like two it's just my real ethos my real goal is like travel the world and meet interesting people and so when i when i kind of rebooted my personal channel earlier this year that was like the main goals the main kind of tenets for everything i do so it's been really fun this year to see that actually come to fruition and to be traveling 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 and not just traveling but doing work too which is yeah. i love well and i'm sure i'll have a bunch of links at the end of this episode in the show notes at hey.film for some of the things we're talking about today, but I should mention up at the top that your YouTube channel is Justin Superstar. Yes. And people should subscribe. Justin Superstar everywhere. I just changed my name on IMDb to Justin Superstar <laughs> because I was like Justin Johnson, like number 38. Really? And I'm like, this is dumb. <laughs> like it's even though Justin Superstar is like silly, like people remember it. Like when I did festivals and, and I, when I would come back to them, people would be like, oh, Justin Superstar is coming back. Cause it's just, it's just more memorable. Yeah. So. You can just Google Justin Superstar. You'll find me literally everywhere, and yeah, YouTube, Facebook, everywhere. Yeah. In this industry, you can brand yourself however you want. <laughs> that and that is like, 
it's crazy, but like that's such an important part of it. Yeah. For you to kind of, for people to kind of know and remember you, um, because there's just so much content, and so to be memorable is just a huge, it's a huge yeah. thing. So for me, it's a silly nickname that is more Googleable. Once I lost the number one Google search result for Justin Johnson, I knew everything had to change. Yeah. It's like a like a Christian rapper took a, <laughs> took over the number one st- spot, and I was like, all right, I need to change things <laughs> well speaking of branding i feel like the way that i talk about myself over the years has changed and changed the kind of business i get like what does it say do you even have a business card what does it say on your like, oh what i would do you write? yeah it's like justin makes documentaries yeah like that's what it says yeah i like that you're using a verb instead of a noun like, why <laughs> like i don't know it's interesting to be like Instead of like, I'm Justin, I'm a documentary filmmaker. Mm. It's I'm Justin, I make documentaries. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a very active, like, it's a very active thing. Yeah. And that was a big transition for me too as well because I think even just three years ago, and especially when, when um, Eric and I first moved to L.A., yeah. I really spoke about myself saying like, oh, I'm a filmmaker. It's like, and you come from the same thing. Yeah. When you come from the world of filmmaking, you kind of have to learn everything from A to Z and then like to be able to specify you slowly say like well I can do funny stuff I can do documentary I can do shorts whatever but as you slowly begin to really find the stuff you make that not only like is the the best stuff or the most popular stuff but the stuff that you the stuff when working on it doesn't feel like work yeah doesn't feel like tedious because we've done a lot of other series before we're like you know series where we're doing things for wired and we're smashing things in slow motion and and all kinds of stuff and I feel like when I would be editing those projects, it just would be it's still fun, but it's not the same as when I'm editing documentary stuff. And it just feels like this puzzle where I know like I've got to go in and slog through it and get everything right. But the challenges are still interesting. And I think that's yeah. really important for any kind of work, especially creatively. Yeah. So the one thing I definitely have to link people to, they have to see this series that you just worked on for Sci-Fi, the television yeah. channel. Tell me about what this was I mean it's, it was like a dream project it really was just like the perfect hybrid because uh, Eric Beck uh, if you don't know the co-founder of Indie Mogul with me and we have a production company together and so essentially it was this perfect project where it was uh, all about sci-fi is really all about fan creators yeah and so um, we were approached uh, through Tongle who we do it's a great site that uh, we do a lot of our work through and essentially uh, about this series, a, doc- a documentary series about create fan creators, people who are like whether they're cosplayers or costumers right. or they do nerdy arts like painting or watercolors or whatever, a series to essentially make a 60 second TV spot out of yeah. but then also have these different um, individual two-ish minute long documentaries. Right. So because it was this perfect hybrid where Eric is literally exactly the fan creator right. type like he is the first episode he's the subject of one of them yeah <laughs> he is, uh, he is, it's that perfect and then i really have, um am more known for my documentary work it just kind of came together as this perfect project so we started that in march and we started filming in april and we filmed uh, 10 different creators from los angeles to brooklyn down to atlanta chicago all over the place um and uh those were starting to be released last month so yeah. we did 10 of them plus the spot that's it's probably i think it may still be airing on tv yeah um and it just was it is great like it was so much travel but we got to meet so many interesting people and see so many different there's this thing this incredible watercolor artist who lives up in seattle and so i mean just filming the process of watercolor is so fun because it's just it's just there's just so much going on there's so much yeah. movement and, and colors combining and things like that so that was a series that um took up a good chunk of the year but really was just that perfect hybrid of, for for eric and i and then just in terms of documentary stuff exactly what i like to do yeah well and i read the profile about this project on tongle and i thought it was interesting how you started like tyler helped you whittle down from like 40 potential subjects and once you figured out, I guess you're ten. The you, I mean, you kind of organized it by location, so you could like get these ones yeah. done in LA, and then <laughs> it was that. The logistically, it's tricky when you're because we needed to keep our shoot pretty pretty um, quick because yeah. every day you spend on the road, you're you're having to feed your crew. And mind, there was only four of us, but still, you've got to get fed, you've got to stay somewhere, and so every day on the road just eats into your budget. So we yeah. knew we wanted it to be as jam packed as possible. So you have to work backwards from 
10 different people's schedules. Right. <laughs> so that from a logistical standpoint was, was um, super intense, but we were able to find just like the perfect like two weeks yeah. where, where like it totally worked out. And one thing that was just really fun about the project as well is that when you have like four people, which I think when you're traveling is kind of the, the sweet spot, because if you have five people, all of a sudden you don't really fit in all cars, right. you need a bigger car, and even then you have gear and everything like that. Um, and uh, so we would always stay in like Airbnb houses. So it because you for four like crappy hotel yeah. rooms, you put, what is it, sixty bucks a night, seventy bucks a night? You yeah, times up. four, like you might as well just get a house yeah. somewhere. <laughs> so it became this really fun, just like road trip um, type adventure that was not just not ro ro exactly a road trip, but like a road trip that had just like constant work. I think we had maybe one day off. With, without uh, filming or, or traveling. Yeah. So it was just, it was super, it was like filming a feature, really. Yeah. Um, but again, it was like just perfect for what we do. Well, and you did this really interesting production technique that I, I guess I wouldn't have thought of, but it makes so much sense. For a couple of the people in New York, you actually had me record audio with your right. subjects. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, and that, it, like that you worked did, out perfectly. You just did an interview over like Skype with them. Yeah. And exactly. I was just sitting there next to them with the microphone on that's something that i found so this is i think in terms of just like really practical tips for any filmmakers who are doing documentary stuff that's something i as i've worked with um abbott on this series about their their innovators um and and we did do this a uh, bit as well we did do this a lot with the sci-fi project as, as well but um essentially the idea is if i can record a interview that i don't have to fly to right save so much money but get it in high quality because I'm usually doing a pre-interview anyways right with a, you a have subject. to talk to him on the phone yeah. you gotta talk to him on the phone and you have, it helps you establish your story and your questions and before I would take the phone conversation and I would transcribe it and I would essentially build like a script from that Yeah. something the client can see because I don't want to write with that. that's why I do yeah. documentary I, it just makes my skin crawl to like write down what's right. I don't, I'm not an expert in whatever they do and anytime a client that's gives it. me a script for someone to read they don't perform it very well no. you kind of need them to answer a legitimate off the cuff question precisely and so uh, what I found is that if you ever have the opportunity and even now for some projects I, I will just fly uh, just me you know no crew no one else yeah. but just fly me to whatever location that the, the person's at and bring like good audio recording gear and do like a 30 to 45 minute interview because you're able to ask them the questions and get good responses but be able to have audio you can actually use in the final edit and then when you sit down with an actual crew not only are they comfortable with you because they've already right. had a conversation with you but you're able to be super super targeted in what you ask yeah. because you just kind of need you know those maybe 10 to 20 seconds where they're talking on camera right. and the rest is just Voice server you've already recorded yeah. that goes um, underneath B roll. So well, that's why I think this is so it's ingenious. A really great, it's, it's a great technique and it saves, it makes the actual shoot day a lot less, um, there's less variables. Yeah. And I think that's, as a filmmaker, you're always trying to reduce the amount of things that can go wrong or you always want to have, especially documentary, have as much of a safety net as possible. Yeah. You're right that interviews can be intimidating for people. So it's limiting the amount of time that <sighs> yeah. is I part mean, of your day. Yeah. I found that especially with people who are not used to being on camera, they can be really eloquent and and really kind of get across their point very well in a casual interview that doesn't have cameras. But then on the day, there'll only be these little tiny moments when they kind of forget about the camera yeah. because it, it's just intense and you've got to turn off the air conditioning and it gets really hot. It just kind of feels like an interrogation. Yeah. <laughs> and so you're if you didn't have that um, audio, from before in high quality you would be talking with them for an hour and it just I think it would just break them down yeah so there have been several instances where it just proved to be so so useful and that's a technique that um, I started using maybe like a year and a half ago but it's been it's been just great so especially if you have a filmmaker friend like in New York yeah. who can go out <laughs> and help me out like that and also in New York the two people we were filming with we did a split day so again yeah. I don't have an hour to right. talk with each person because we maybe had five hours with each one to get all your b-roll to get everything yeah. so it was really just like b-roll and then like sit down with them for 10 minutes and get just enough to kind of cover yeah. that so that made the split day possible but also like it made the whole storytelling and, and car putting it together before the shoot yeah. also a lot more easy well i'm surprised i haven't stolen this technique from you yet because <laughs> 
like watching yeah. watching these sci-fi pieces, your end product is very similar to the way that I might edit interviews into a piece. Ultimately, you only see these people talking to the camera maybe twice in a whole two-minute piece, and everything else could have been captured video, could have been captured in audio. You don't know, but it doesn't matter. In the end, it's matter. just audio that you're using. So yeah, why not get you the entire st- interview audio? <laughs> you can steal it, Griffin. I have a package. It's fifty nine ninety five per year, and you can use the Justin technique, fully licensed. <laughs> yeah. Can I get a package where I also get the the, the Swiss blogging blog? oh, technique? That is uh, that's extra, but we'll we'll talk about that afterwards. <laughs> So speaking of the kind of blogging you're doing, or you have done for a long time, you just came out with a really cool video. You were in Kitz- Kitzbühel? Kitzbühel? Kitzbühel, yeah. Kitzbühel, Austria. So that's one thing, like, um, so I was in Switzerland filming for this, uh, another episode for the series for yeah. Abbott, because there's a there's a bunch of scientists in Switzerland who make this incredible uh, magnetically levitated heart pump. Yeah. And so it just so happened that there was a film festival that my feature documentary premiered at three years ago that was happening right after and, and kind of concurrently to my shoot. So um, I took a trip to, to kind of visit that over there. But um, for me, it was like anytime I'm doing additional travel or whatever, it's just I want to bring a camera. I want to make something. So I did a little thing called uh, Justin's Journeys and to, to Kitzbühel, Austria, and put it up on my, on my YouTube channel because really at the beginning of this year, that was a big goal for me is like I want to be putting up more of my own content um, my own stuff that's like gonna be out there for everyone to, to check out so it's a little like four minute video about me going through the these beautiful like the trains and you would go up the tram to see the incredible there's like a mountain there's like a ski race uh, up there yeah. in Kitzbühel so um, that's something that just came out and uh, it, it's fun like that kind of stuff is just really fun to do um, and actually I just started a Patreon too not because yeah. I need to like not because like I specifically need the money to um, produce these things, but I found like I really struggle if I don't have a client getting work out in like a in like a timely manner, especially for personal projects. I always like look at it as um, this is kind of you know it goes back. You have to figure out what makes you work best. Like I need to have like an audience to put it out to. I need to have like a deadline, and I need to have some kind of like subject or theme. Yeah. So I found that like. By starting this Patreon, I have this, it's that kind of monkey on your back when you have a client where you're like, my friends, you know, right now it's just like six or seven people, um, but it's like my friends are like, believe in me enough to like put a couple bucks uh, towards me each month. And so they kind of become my client. Right. So I found it so far it's just my first month, but like really effective to drive me to put out more content on my personal channel to have that extra incentive um so yeah that was the first uh, uh, kind of using that as like a motivational yeah. technique it's kind of why I, I created the podcast just to force myself to make something regularly right <laughs> well you're amazing at it that's why i always <laughs> admire about you is like your consistency it's the fact that like you um what is it 77 episodes 76 <laughs> i mean that's just that's just amazing because i'm i'm really good at starting stuff but like it's so easy to get distracted by yeah. other stuff uh, and I was just doing a talk with some younger filmmakers a couple weeks ago and, and they were kind of asking like, well, I want to make my own stuff, but like, I feel like I, I just never, I don't have the time. I know high school students are, are busy yeah. and that kind of stuff, but really it's like you always, you can always make the time. If you care about something you and, and you're really motivated, like you will find the time. Yeah. And so even for me, like being super busy with these other projects, like, there were moments I could have worked to do my own personal videos, but because I didn't have an ex- a strong external factor making me do it, like it just didn't get done. So I knew I know I have the time, and now like even though I was traveling the last couple of weeks, like I still knew I had to get that video out like first Tuesday of every month. I have quote unquote clients uh, now who are depending on me. Yeah. So that just was a big motivator for me. Yeah. Well, I. I've always looked at you as kind of like, I wish I could make as much content as Justin. <laughs> like over the years, you've always made just more frequency of stuff than I have. Like when you started in, you started uh, film fights mm-hmm. and we both competed against each other on film fights. And I always felt like you, I mean, you must have doubled my output there. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and that, and again, I, I invented, you know, for filmfights.com, it's like a website where you can basically gives you a title, a genre and a time limit. And for me, that was the same thing as like starting this Patreon yeah. and that kind of thing. It's, it was a framework w- with which 
I wanted it to push me to make more content. And when I look back at the things that I made, especially early on in my career, it must have been like 90% were for film, for film yeah. fights. And so it was just creating the structure that worked for me. And thankfully it worked for a lot of other people and allowed me to meet uh, awesome people you know, like you. And I think that's really been a driving force throughout the last you know, 15 plus years I've been doing this. Is yeah. we're Actually, it's almost the 15th anniversary of Film Fights, wow. which is crazy. Yeah, <laughs> It's totally crazy. Um, but it's that giving me that framework, that structure yeah. that I needed. And that's, that's why I had made so many yeah. videos. It just worked for me. And then for a long time, you made so many vid blogs. Nowadays, you're making Swish blogs. Yeah, Swish blogs. I guess I'm curious... <laughs> Just because I, I see you as someone who like has a camera out a lot. Like when I walked uh, up to the hotel, yeah. you were filming me. Yeah, yeah exactly. Got it. <laughs> like, what is your philosophy on kind of like output of work? Is it important to you? Does that lead to work? Is there a reason why you make a lot of videos? Absolutely. And I think, and then again, this is when I was talking to the, the high school kids um, a couple weeks ago. This is something they kind of asked. It's like, I think, and I've seen film groups over the years, uh, especially younger ones in high school coming up through film fights or whatever. Yeah. I feel like if it's like four or five kids, it always kind of breaks down to the one person who cares and their friends. Right. So it's the one person who cares and then the three or four other ones who are kind of just along for the ride. And so when you're the one person that cares, like it's not like how do I find time to make these videos and stuff like It's just something that is like, it's in your DNA. It's like built into you. It's intrinsic to who you are. It's like you have to make stuff. Yeah. And so I've tried to find ways that allow me to continue making stuff that are that aren't like super intrusive. So when I was doing vid blogs when I first started, um, I just always <laughs> I had my big Canon GL1 <laughs> camera, which is not you know it's, it's not an iPhone. It's not right. a it's, it's something you need in a backpack. <laughs> it doesn't go in your pocket. Um, because I wanted to, uh, it really makes sense now thinking back on it, but it was because I wanted to just have material to edit. Yeah. I didn't want to write a script. I didn't want to cast people. I didn't want to do that kind of stuff. I just wanted to film my life because it gave me this little sandbox with which to get better at editing at. Yeah. And so um, for me, it's like, I think, and even for this trip for, for going to Norway, like it's it's a trip that's like for fun, but I've like reached out to YouTube and I'm gonna borrow a VR 180 camera yeah. to film the trip in because um, for me it's like really important to to always be like learning new techniques. But I think it's kind of a shame if you're not if you're not documenting it in some way. Yeah, photos aren't really satisfying to me. Instagram is like fun, but it's not really. I mean, like my wife and I will get drunk and like we'll watch old vid vlogs and it's just like. <laughs> To have those kinds of memories, yeah. <laughs> and even if it's like 2 a.m. and you're eating a pizza and you're watching them and you're just crying because you're remembering how wonderful everything's been. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like so important to have those kinds of memories because really it's it just slips through your fingers if you if you don't capture it and it's gone. And for me, I'm pretty forgetful. So yeah. for having the having the Swish blogs allow me to like look through a whole year and do it in a way that's not doesn't take up too much brain space to edit that is just like a thing that's super important for me just for my life. And so I find it very easy to create the content because it is just something that having done this since I was eight years old, it's just so built into who I am yeah. that I, it would be torturous to turn it off. Yeah. So I have some questions from the audience, but before I do that, I should mention that today's episode is brought to us by Squarespace, Great. which is where griffinhammond.com is hosted. I've found it's an effective way for me to have a website, host the podcast. I use that platform for the podcast. Uh, and also you can get 10% off your Squarespace website by going to squarespace.com slash griffin. 10% off your first purchase. If I didn't already have Squarespace, I would <laughs> do that right now. <laughs> if I didn't already have it. Yeah, oh man, give yourself a deal. Yeah. So our first question today comes from John Luna, who often edits the podcast. And he's wondering, he's also really into documentary kind of shooting. And he's just wondering, what suggestions do you have for someone who wants to make documentaries, but how do you go about finding good stories to tell? That... That's a great question, and I find that like, um, if you want to make documentaries, like, it's it's not a bad idea just to practice with people you know. Like, if it's something you're not, 
if you're not super familiar in the in the form and that yeah. kind of stuff like really for me just filming with my friends was was great practice like you can do you can make a compelling two or three minute documentary about just like really just about anyone yeah so if you're looking around like your local town or whatever it's good to kind of like practice and and, and maybe there's an interesting shopkeeper or whatever like there there's so many subjects that you can find but I, even like let's see what i do recently um i just posted on facebook i was like who do i know like who in the la area has friends or people who are like interesting to do documentaries yeah about? and i got a list of like 30 people that i would have never thought of on my own right so well, you we did one about out. someone who made a C-3PO. Like, yeah, this guy, come? Gordon Tarpley. So that was kind of a part of that was me asking who's who has interesting stories out yeah. there. And so Gordon Tarpley is one of the top, if not the top, C-3PO costumers <laughs> in the world and um, has worked with us before on other projects. Yeah. And through this Facebook post, someone suggested him and yeah. I did a... I rented, and again, this is part of me like building in like a timeline for myself, but I rented a C300 Mark II. So I have the camera for a week. So I'm like, I gotta use this while I have it yeah. because otherwise it's a total waste of, waste of money. So I filmed with Gordon for a day and like, just kind of asked him like, what's your busiest day this week? And he's like, well, I'm doing this thing at the Chinese theater on yeah. Thursday. I'm like, that sounds amazing. So I filmed with him for, um, for a day. And then that ended up actually being like a perfect thing to pitch when sci-fi came to us about the yeah. the um, sci-fi fan creators project and gordon was one of our subjects um so oh, so you ended up making yeah another we, film another about film about gordon and actually using some of the assets i already shot nice yeah. from the previous thing because uh, you know i already have it so you started with exactly. a free passion project and it became a paid instantly project. just it's so crazy how fast that happens yeah. and there's another one i did about a guy who's like a typewriter poet yeah so and that, and that came from that same thread so like I, that worked pretty well for me. Like I'd honestly just suggest reaching out to your social network, reaching out to people on Facebook or, or wherever and be like, you know, Hey friends who live in town, like who's someone really interesting I should do a documentary about. Yeah. And I bet you'll get like, Oh, I know this. Cause I find it's like, I find it's a lot easier. And again, this goes back to my documentary uh, core is I find it, I consider a good narrative director and this isn't like a total absolute, but a good narrative director, it's kind of like a hammer. They're like, I've got this idea and I'm going to like make it exist. Boom, boom, boom. And it's like writing a script and casting the people and making your vision like come to life. And as a documentary director, I think of myself as more of like a sponge. I just want to be put in like the right area and kind of absorb yeah. things that were already going to happen. And so I found that like finding the subjects for documentaries came from that same kind of sponge way where I just asked who who do you know friends in LA who do you know who's interesting yeah. and I got so many different responses so that can be a great way of just beginning uh, the, the process and then you have someone who you make a piece and you learn from it and um, but at least you know like your local kinds of friends and family will be interested yeah. in that and as well if there's like a topic that really interests you and um, it's something that you want to con continue like doing work in that field then find someone who is accessible that work, works within that kind of space. Yeah. Like I, I saw a documentary once um, from this uh, Italian director that's about like the lost wax process of making a bronze statue and it's like yeah. a 77 minute movie and it's so beautifully done and he was and it's just like there's no talking at all it's just the process the sounds the process of making this lost wax sculpture and he was saying his next project was like something about people making like movie theater chairs so his next project became like also a, a creating kind of thing yeah but like apparently like these chairs like go on a boat across the ocean i don't know it sounded yeah. insane <laughs> but uh you know what you just know kind of like what you create think of it like a like a ladder you know like it's the rung that goes to the next rung that goes to the next room yeah. so the more in the zone of something you're passionate about like the better yeah when well, i like the technique of asking your friends on Facebook. I mean, it works. Because the side effect is also that you're branding yourself as, hey, I'm Justin, the guy that makes documentaries. Exactly. Like, even if you get no good ideas from it, you've still put out the, yeah. the call. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's the more the more stuff you do, the more kinds of, the more ideas and the more suggestions will, will come 
from uh, you that way. So yeah, even from, so I did a short film, short documentary that um, played at a bunch of festivals last year is about yeah. a woman who's a professional spoon player. This is Abby the Spoon Lady. Abby the Spoon Lady. Great, uh, great moniker she's got. And so that came about, same kind of sponge technique. Like I was already gonna film with my friends, Robin and Corinne, who have a YouTube channel called Threadbanger in Asheville, North Carolina. And yeah. I wanted to film a day with them, a day with someone else. And I asked them, I was like, who in town yeah. is interesting that would be interesting to do a documentary on and they're like you have to talk to abby the spoon lady like yeah. she's a local busker she just plays music and and people toss her money and she's super awesome and so i was like great emailed i got a big list of maybe 10 other people that we did research on but like abby was by far the most interesting yeah reached out to her and she reached back and um it became i think it's I don't know, a couple hundred thousand views on Facebook, a couple hundred thousand on YouTube. And after we filmed the documentary with her, she actually had a video on Facebook get like 20 million views. So yeah. it was this kind of perfect intersection of like timing and topic. And um, now she's got like this this huge audience. So it's that, you know, it's let the kind of, let the universe send you the topics and, and open yourself up to it. Yeah. And I think that's, that, that's worked well for me. And you also just took advantage of the fact that I'm out of LA for another reason, let me tell a story that's not... You don't have to tell stories in your hometown or no. where you're living. I, and I, I think it's... I found that it's like, I'm really bored filming stuff in LA. I would rather like find a cheap ticket, plane ticket somewhere, yeah. and then just work backwards from that because... Um, I imagine there's a travel. few filmmakers in LA telling a few stories there's in LA. <laughs> <laughs> but there's so... That's the thing that's great about documentary is there are so many stories that will never be filmed Yeah, that are the so compelling and so fascinating and even like stories that uh maybe film that are great stories but just won't be turned into good content <laughs> right so never you know even if it's already been done or whatever like interesting stories interesting stories so don't don't let that stop you yeah we have a question from let's see from fabio oh nice who has some films on some video on demand platforms and he's wondering, I mean, I suppose this goes for video on demand or non, you know, free stuff, but what's the best marketing strategy that you've applied for distribution? Man, well, I, I feel like this is probably a question you can answer better than I can. Yeah, I mean, neither of us have done like full scale distribution of anything like that. Like I've done a lot of self distribution for yeah. Sriracha. Um, I mean, my, so my feature film was, was represented or is represented by a distribution company called Film Buff. Yeah. And now they're called Gunpowder and Sky, I believe. Uh, but they've they've done a lot of stuff, and, and um, it was great because they basically got me on the platforms. Yeah. But I I essentially paid for a, a PR company, a marketing company, to yeah. promote the film while I was doing my festival tour, and I'm really glad I did because um, it was it was a a very it was a not insubstantial expense, but they were able to get me articles and like local papers, and they yeah. helped me with the premiere of the film in LA. So I mean, <laughs> I guess I guess my tip is just to pay someone. <laughs> yeah. Well, and even though you paid for it, you're getting what's called earned media rather than paid media. Like this wasn't marketing. You weren't putting it on Facebook ads. Mm -hmm. You were getting it in newspapers. Yeah. And I felt like that's what worked for Sriracha too. Was I mean, I I think I did a little bit of Facebook ads, but I don't think that led to very much. I mostly got lucky. Like I got one big reporter writing about it and then it kind of cascaded into yeah. more. But yeah, I think if you can talk to reporters and get organic articles in real news. And if you have a niche, I mean, that's the thing too. It's like if your film has a specific niche it's speaking to, so whether it's music. So for Abby the Spoon Lady, the short documentary, I specifically submitted to festivals that had like a music, either they were like, uh, music was like a big theme of the festival yeah. or they had a specific like music documentary program. So I really targeted my submissions to that. So the same yeah. could be said for if you do a film or a short um, or a feature, or whatever that's within a niche, you can email the, whether it's a, it's a, whole, a documentary about a, someone who does a haunted house, like you can reach out to those niche kind of places and they'll be hungry for more content because it really is like specific to what they do so if you've got that kind of like core anchor for your content and you reach out to them individually you'll find a lot more success than if you make something that's like just totally generic 
and then kind of where where do you reach out to where yeah. do you you don't have it so well and that's one thing i like about documentary is i feel like if i was making a fiction film i would be completely lost on how to market it because how do you convince strangers that they should care about your made-up story that <laughs> is like you know from your heart yeah. whereas like everything you do i mean abby the spoon lady there's a whole community in Asheville that already knows who she is and mm -hmm. maybe interested. She has her own fan base. She has her own way to get people excited about her story yeah. that then may want to watch the film. And for Gordon, the guy who does uh, C-3PO stuff, like he yeah. has a pretty big audience on Instagram. And for I did another short about a guy who's a typewriter poet. And there were people who found that and was like, oh, he you know, wrote for me at this event or this kind of thing. I have his like poetry framed. Yeah. So the people who are already kind of out there in the public and they have like an audience already who wants to learn more about them, wants to see kind of a different side or, or a different um, part of them. So that that's always like a consideration too. If you do something, if you do something about Star Trek, there's a lot of people who like Star Trek. So right away, people will care. Yeah. Um, so that's just important. Uh, if if that is your big goal of yours, like to be able to pick something that has a, a built-in endemic audience, that's super important because then you know where to promote it. If you don't have, if, if you can't say where you're going to promote your movie, um, even like as you're working on it or before you start it, then, I mean, you're going to have issues getting it out there. <laughs> yeah. We had a couple of questions this week about about matching cameras so like one of them let's see this is a facebook message from the netherlands this is from ari oh nice who's wondering about matching footage between different cameras he's wondering if i use final cut or another application to match footage he's actually specifically wondering about how to match a gh5 and a mavic pro and then i should just read this other question because mm. this is an email from john that i got uh where he's doing interviews in 4k 30p with two cameras he's this these are panasonic cameras and so he's shooting Cine like D in both. Uh, and he says he's spending a lot of time color grading to match the two cameras. So I guess I'm curious, like a lot of the projects you're working on, are you often using two different cameras? Are they two different models? And do you have <laughs> trouble with that? Well, I know I know specifically Premiere, and I'm sure Final Cut has this too, has like a match. There's yeah, like a match. There is color that, like thing automatic. Already. And Premiere has added that recently, I believe. Yeah. When we're typically we're doing projects, we're using like um, an FS7 and an FS5. Yeah. So they're within that same kind of Sony family. And if we bring in another camera, something like an RX100. So we're using cameras that are all within that same that same like lineage yeah. uh, so they all should match pretty well uh so i really haven't and thankfully again like working on um corporate stuff like i'm relatively colorblind so like the color correction part of it is like i can hit the auto button a bunch yeah. but like that's about as far as my <laughs> as my knowledge kind of goes i have so we work with people talented people who, who yeah. make the colors match and make it look right but i think as long as you can stay within that same kind of brand even if you're using different camera models, they'll they'll match you better than if you don't. Yeah. And like again, a lot of times like most people probably won't even notice. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> it's the point one percent of filmmakers will be like, did those do unless it's like egregiously bad. Yeah. Like, whatever. It the content that you create will be the, is the most important part of it versus like the exact color balance. Right. If you're doing a project for a client, of course you want it to be good and hopefully you have a budget to bring in someone to at least give you some kind of help. But um, getting too caught up in the details. Although it's, you had an episode I was listening to where you talked about like footage that was kind of like, maybe it was drone footage that was like uh, moving weirdly. Oh yeah. Like it was like a 30p video and like a 24p thing. And it's like, actually skipping frames because the SD card wasn't fast enough to I was, keep up. I was dealing with that same problem for something else. And there are some things like as a filmmaker, if you notice them and maybe no one else will notice them, but they bother you. Right. Like my advice is just fix it enough so it doesn't bother you anymore yeah. because you don't want your own content to like torture you. Yeah. <laughs> Be like, why didn't I fix that? Oh, because once you do that final render... Yeah, you know, render underscore final, final, final underscore damn it final done before. <laughs> Let's do the final render and get it out there and put it on Facebook, YouTube, wherever. Then you're kind of stuck with it. So once I get to the place where I can watch something, I can watch it five times in a row and there's nothing that's like, ah, oh, why is that still there? I feel like you're in a good place. So if it bugs you enough, fix it till it doesn't bug you. And then yeah. there you go. Well, yeah, I was just thinking the same thing that when you are watching your own edit, 
you're the one watching it critically, but everyone else who's watching a documentary story, they are suspending disbelief. They don't want to think about the fact mm-hmm. that microphones and cameras were involved. They're just <laughs> focused on like, tell me more about yeah. Abby the Spoon Lady. <laughs> and for Abby, like I filmed that on a Canon 80D because it was um, just it was a new, a new camera I got. It was just when I kind of want to test it out. It's got great autofocus and stuff like that. I didn't really know it was going to do this whole film festival thing. Yeah. And so I found that when the short was paired against stuff that was shot with a better camera, I just hated how the short looked. It just didn't look just didn't look good I, yeah. and in hindsight i wish i would have shot with like a c200 or you know um, whatever so um that sort of bugged me but again it's like no one mentioned that to me right everyone's like i want to hear they're like wish it was longer i want to hear more <laughs> so it wasn't really a detriment to the film it just was kind of annoying to me that's yeah. kind of it yeah so i guess i want to close with some advice for people listening to this podcast uh, that may want to do the same kind of thing yeah. that you're doing. And, and we have kind of similar uh, similar things that we're doing in our careers right now. So I guess if you had to give yourself some advice at the start or, mm. or is there something that you feel like you've done that's led you to a place where now you're actually getting the client work uh, that's paying your bills? I mean, I think a big thing for me is like, uh, know who you are like know who you are as a creator because the more work you do within that specific subgenre or whatever the more work you'll get within that and yeah. it becomes this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy so the more you externally say like for me it's uh, I've always said like my goals were and then I did this before I put it as like an external kind of brand thing but it was like I want to travel the world I want to meet interesting people and so any project I filter through those specific bullet points yeah so for me that's been hugely helpful and I've seen it in the last two or three years as I've gone from just kind of generally producing stuff to um, focusing stuff that I direct to be within following within those two buckets because it just creates a and now I'm like uh, I'm, I'm redesigning my website and, I, and I'm looking back at the stuff I've made and I'm like wow I have I'm excited to put, I haven't put together a reel in like, God, I don't even know, <laughs> maybe 10 years, I don't yeah. even know. Um, and so now I'm really excited to put together a reel of my work because even if there's something I did where I didn't love the final product, there's probably like one or two shots that are just like awesome. Yeah. You know, so um, for me in the last two or three years, focusing on documentary and focusing on specifically the type of documentary that I love, which is about interesting people that's just got me more work within that sort of field so i mean if i could go back and like talk to myself in high school or whatever like i really wish i would have made a feature documentary in high school it would have been like probably like pretty bad or whatever but it just would have been a really cool challenge and i think there is still value to doing a feature just from yeah if i would say like the value of like going to college and the value of like finishing a feature <laughs> like probably if you finished a feature doing something that you're passionate about it would be cheaper and have more value than right. going to college <laughs> yeah because at least like doing a feature you have like a product versus paper which certainly in some industries you have to go to college so i get yeah. it like go to school kids but um i could i wish i would i could go back and really like lock myself into the documentary genre earlier and when I look back at my early work, the stuff that I still like the most was all stuff within the documentary. For the most part, it was all stuff within the documentary field. Yeah. So I wish I would have noticed that earlier, locked onto that earlier, and really like um, put put my kind of stamp on that on that medium as soon as I could because I think that would have put my career in the right trajectory or, uh, earlier than later. But still, it's something that just comes with time. Yeah, you know, as you create more stuff, you learn what you don't like. Stop doing the things you don't like and do more of the things you do like. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we do this stuff anyways. Yeah. We have to like it. <laughs> you can get a job you don't like. That's easy. <laughs> Getting Making a job that you love, that's 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 harder. Yeah. Well, good good job. Congratulations. Oh, thanks. Well, you know, <laughs> it's like I, I uh, Eric and I are kind of, we come from similar backgrounds where we grew up with like uh, families that just didn't have a lot of money and kind of random small towns. And yeah. so I find that like, I think the hardest thing is for people who are 
are never happy and never satisfied. I think that can come if you come from a successful family or you just have that kind of disposition. And so even for me, I, I just never feel like I've, I feel really good about what I've done over the last year, but never feel like I've really made it. And so for Eric and I, we always say that if we could go back in time and tell our eight-year-old selves all the things we've done by 36, like we would be just amazed. It's a lifetime worth right. of things to do. <laughs> just the last like three weeks of my life is yeah. like, if I would tell myself, like, growing up in small town Wisconsin. Yeah, I just took I was, a train from yeah. Switzerland to Austria. I was in Austria, <laughs> and then I was at a film festival, and I was filming with scientists, and then I flipped to New York for 24 hours from Florida, and then I'm going yeah. to ignore it. Like, we always say that we're, we're always happy, but we're never satisfied. So never have found, I never feel like I've done enough work, or the work is perfect where I can't continue to improve on it, but I'm always super thankful and super happy for where I'm at. Yeah. So I accept your congratulations. <laughs> but, I, but deep down inside, I know I, well, I still have so much more work to do. Yeah. I think that'll resonate with people listening and also hopefully inspire people to keep working hard. Doing to things subscribe to all my yeah. platforms. And, and <laughs> well, yeah, before we go, we should talk about the things that we want to promote for you. Uh, I'll put a bunch of these things in the show notes at Hate on Film, but people should definitely go to your YouTube channel youtube.com slash Justin Superstar. Subscribe. Uh, they should check out the sci-fi series yeah. that you did. I'll put that in the show notes. Sci-fi.com slash fan creators. You can see all of them on there. And then on Facebook as well is, is Justin Superstar on Facebook. And that's, for me, it's really just been a great passion project to have, to, to relaunch my personal channel and be able to uh, dig back into doing now that I've done a lot of commercial work dig back in, into doing just the personal projects because yeah. it's great when you're your own you're your own client you decide when it's done yeah that's a great feeling so I'll be posting more of that stuff going forward yeah and then I just need to to mention one thing is that I was just on a podcast by Ian O'Neill he has a new podcast called How They Did It Filmmaking okay. and he had me on last week so there's a new episode of that I'll put that in the show notes as well or you can just look for How They Did It Filmmaking on iTunes so thank you Justin cool. thank you yeah this is awesome <laughs> <laughs> how did you attach that light to the wall use the Pedco Ultra Clamp hmm. the best piece of filmmaking equipment there is <laughs> That's great, I love that. <laughs>